Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. Hello mate. Yeah, very good mate, very good. You've got all your Gucci gear now, haven't you? You've got this mic and these headphones, which are very good, uh, I have to say. Yeah. Um, but the room's the right state at the minute. Um, splitting the room, uh, our spare room. Uh, Beck's oh. going to have her own little salon in there. So. Oh, is she? She's, uh, uh, she's so going solo. Is she going to start doing her own thing now? She, she's been doing it solo since just before COVID. Um, so it put sort of spanner in the works, but she's been doing it mobile the whole time, whole time anyway. Has she? Um, yeah, but now she's like, I kind of want my own space where people can come here and do it. And I'm, so she's like, can we take away the podcast room? And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I've literally just got it set up. <laughs> yeah. It's literally just how I like it. How does that work in your place then? Not to share too much sort of personal stuff, but do you got, is it like one of the shoot off rooms as you come into the house or do you have to weave through the, the Johnson household? Yeah, it's up there. It's one of the spare bedrooms, not a spare bedrooms because, one of the when the girls is older, she's probably going to want this as her bedroom. But um, hey, at the moment, you still so get on. What you guys are looking for is exactly, and this would sound like a dick thing to say. It's not intended to be a dick thing, but we've got two um, spare rooms um, off our hallway on the left hand side of our house. It was this was an extension done long before we were here, and basically, one of them's a playroom, and one of them's the room I'm in now, which is like a long study. And uh, we've got a couple of desks in here and whiteboards and all the podcast kits that's in here. But I've often looked at these rooms and I'm like, you know what? These are perfect for consulting rooms. They're perfect for massage rooms. They'd be ideal for like anything that requires this. This is basically set up. I think somebody before here must have done something where yeah. people, people walk straight in and shoot straight off into these rooms. Um, and you could you could totally run like probably two businesses from here. Uh, that actually require like in person physical no. stuff, but we don't really use them. No, we use the the front one was like we we said to the boys when they were first um when we first moved in, do they want to make it a games room? Because otherwise, we'll, we'll put it as Lily's playroom, and they could they just couldn't decide between themselves what they were going to do with it. So we ended <laughs> up just letting Lily have it as a playroom, and it's beautiful, and we painted it really nice and put inspiring stuff all over the walls. But last she's like nine, so she doesn't really. Yeah use it you know her and her friends go in there and just make it messy and then we just tell them to study it and it's basically you just pass through the room come into the office so i think it's such a bloody waste but we're looking to move anyway so oh yeah nice same same area or um you know what mate so i did i don't know a decade so i did 10 years maybe 11 years on the on court on the retained and i never obviously entertained living outside of the area because of obviously old geographical um handcuffs as it were but I left the retained three or four years ago, or the on-call, and um, so I don't need to be in the town. So the yeah. qu- quick answer to your question is no, probably. Um, that having been said, I've got a whole bunch of clients around this area, and the horses are quite close to here, and my gym is quite close to here. So we don't need to be in the town. The big goal is to get out of the town. <laughs> Sounds harsh. Oh, okay. <laughs> But um, yeah, I just want like yeah, no, no. I don't necessarily I want feeling, fields, I know but feeling. I don't. Uh, <clears throat> my wife wants fields for the horses, and I've got this thing in my head. Do you remember Dallas? Do you ever watch Dallas when you were a kid? Uh, it, was a, it was a little probably bit, a touch before my time, mate. It was a touch. <laughs> yeah, pff, same makes sound bad. It was a touch before both of our times, probably. But I, uh, I used to. My mom got me the box set when I was a kid, and uh, I watched it. And the whole they had this uh, thing where when Jr. would have breakfast. He is like wife had come from one place on the estate and then his kids come from another place on the estate and they'd ride in on horses and they'd come to breakfast at the uh, at the JR household. So I have that kind of thing where like my wife has to go off in the morning and see to the horses and then <clears throat> I'll go to the gym or whatever and then we come home again. But I'd quite like it where it's all kind of in the same place. You know, we have like a yeah. converted barn just out the front for the gym and then horses can be stabled at the house and you know but they are, we, we want a smaller house we don't need a house um that's this yeah. big anymore because our eldest has moved out i'm super excited and optimistic that our second eldest will move out in the not too distant future as well <laughs> i'm not sure how much of the optimism is shared um and then it'll just be me and the girls so we've got you know we've got a spare ping pong room upstairs that we never use now and we've got these two spare rooms off the hallway which we don't bloody use so you just sort of bumble about it really 
um, which is yeah. a nice problem to have. But um, we just don't need the space. And I know there's a bunch of people no. that, that would that would just use this space a lot better. We want more space, but less smaller house. If that makes sense. We want land, but a smaller house. Problem with a lot yeah, of land, yeah. they come with bigger houses. We don't need a bigger Probably. house. Yeah. People like big houses yeah. so they can like, you know, wave them with it like an ego flow. Like, Look at my big house. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, yeah. Done that. It doesn't really interest me. I did that with lots of stuff though. And you know what? We kind of, I feel like we're going to jump, jump straight head first into something here where we're like, what is that aspect of, of people that we want to, the thing we think we want because of why we want it and what it, what it will say of us to have achieved it. And I think there's an addiction thing within me that I'm constantly chasing that goal um, and then I get it. And I think I'm kind of out of this habit now, hopefully. But I've done it with cars. I've done it with motorbikes. I did it with a house. I've done it with businesses where I'm like, I'm going to build this big thing. And then I build it and I'm like, meh, bored now. Do you, have you ever yeah, had I, that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you were to speak to my other half, she'd be saying, you're always right. what's next? What's next? What's next? You're not, um, are we not enough here? Is that not enough? What we've got here, you know, we've got... That's an my interesting ears, concept. I feel like I wasted so much of my 20s with my mental not so much my mental health problems at the time because I didn't put it down to that I put it down to me being useless with money and <laughs> I had no I had no money for anything so yeah. now I'm a bit more successful with money and I'm trying to learn as quickly as I can because I feel like I've lost time I'm on to the next thing straight away next thing next thing the charity swim and I'm like, right, I'm pushing for my EFAD so I can do that, this, that, and the other. You just did your EFAD, didn't you? You did a two-week EFAD. Yeah. You literally passed like a few days ago. Yeah, uh, literally yesterday. Congratulations, yeah. my man. How did you find yeah, it? Yeah, thank you, mate. Yeah. It was good. Um, so I had oh, about seven, ten days before that course commenced. I took a week's sick leave. Um, it'd been a stressful few weeks. We've got a lot of stuff going on at home, um, which is unlike me to just book it off. But, you know, as you'll know, having spent time retained, if you've got other stuff going on, then you get back from your whole time job. The last thing you want to be doing is those tones going down. Yeah. And I just reached a point where I was like, I need a break. So I took some time off, concentrated on what matters at home and, you know, spent some time with the girl. And then I went into, I hadn't even looked at the joining instructions for this course. I just knew I had to be at the training center on Monday morning. Yeah. So I went there, they turned up and they're like, so we've got this exam for you. Um, here it is. 70 questions. I think it was highway code, road craft, and sign. Um, was that a paper one, got... or did you have to like, in, was it an interactive one that you couldn't, uh, how did you have to do no, it? Was paper. it paper-based? Okay. Yeah, paper-based. And they said, um, they're all lovely there. They're really, really good, um, uh, what do you call them? Yeah, facilitators, trainers, whatever. Really good uh, training centre crew there. They know this. Um, and they said, look, you will get an opportunity to take it again later in the course. But they said, this two-week course is very intensive. And they said, we don't want you stressing about this exam. So do your best. And I'd already said to them that I, I haven't studied for this at all. Like, they give me the book that I was meant to get eight weeks before. I think they turned up two weeks before. Nice. I said, I've had other stuff going on. Um, anyway, I somehow got through it and I, and I passed that. So I would, you know, the highway code and stuff. There and I, yeah. yeah. It, was the, it, it was the road craft. It's like a police handbook, police uh, handbook road yeah, yeah, I remember it. That was the one I scored less on, but it wasn't too bad. So we got through that, and then I had—I know different counties do it uh, differently. We have um, four days in a response car that's manual, so they get you to uh, learn the systems of control of the vehicle. You know, slowing down for bends yeah, and minute yeah, points yeah. and all that stuff. And then last Friday into the truck, um, I, mate, I absolutely loved it. It was. Like Monday, Tuesday this week was two till half ten at night. So you do nighttime driving as well. Um, my biggest thing was I was too. Oh, he said you're very cautious, which he said I'd rather you be that way. Um, I just didn't put a lot of faith in the truck initially. We've got okay. Scania Euro Six uh, rescue pump, which is what I was trained in as well. Yeah, we had Scanias, but we learned on a couple of old. We had a Volvo. We learned on, and we also have like a big range change. Um, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it was six up, six down. Horrible, bloody box box lorry that we also learned yeah, on. I don't even think you learn. I mean, my <clears throat> my HGV I done was in automatic. They don't. I don't mean they do. It's a separate thing. Did you re- did you do response driving in automatic? Out of curiosity, this is this was my response driving. Yeah, yeah I know, but E-fad, I mean, yeah. when you actually did your EFAD response assessment your actual exam did you do it in automatic yeah controversial 
I think that is yeah. very controversial, only because, and this is not, you know, we're not going anywhere in trouble. Nobody knows what brigades are from anyway. But when I when I do mine, so I'm reaching back now. How long have I been driving the trucks? <sighs> eleven years, probably eleven years. Yeah, I think about eleven years. I did it when I was yeah, eleven years. And we learned that, and this is still the case now because I did an, a, a refresher maybe two or three weeks ago, and the idea of the pendulum effect with the water and the baffles in the tank and that sort of stuff. And we used, we would change all the way down to one, then change back up to two every time we came into a roundabout or something like that, so that the vehicle doesn't... So if you sit in automatic, the vehicle will obviously naturally change up or down to um, you know suit the speed and most economical driving and all that sort of stuff. But if it changes down whilst you're halfway around a roundabout, you risk that pendulum effect as the vehicle changes gears and then it sloshes itself a little bit about and there's a there's a potential danger okay. obviously of you losing control of the vehicle a little bit so you pre-select second i'm pretty sure it was i'm getting this wrong now no you pre-select second yeah so as you're coming into the roundabout you'd go see you know your response driving fourth you're approaching the roundabout blues go on you know five four three two one as in you flick down on the right hand side on the paddles and then flick back up to two so you pre-select two and then as you're approaching the junction, it will naturally change itself down, but it won't go lower than two. So you'll enter the junction at two, but it won't change back up. So as you start to, you know, you, you pick your position in, you come into it, and as you start to speed up as you come out of the roundabout, it won't naturally kick itself up into third and, and okay. throw you about. That might be a slight variation, but I know it was something they were really, really heavy on. Now, a lot of people do drive constantly in automatic you know a lot of the fire engines now are like big go-karts aren't they basically but whenever we sit our refreshers or anything like yeah. that the 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 company line is you know when you're doing efad do you drive in, in automatic no boss no never absolutely not of course i don't i do really I drive, yeah yeah that's it because so they, they suggest you haven't, you haven't got um the, they say you haven't got control of the vehicle wow yeah so we there is uh the option for tiptronic controls of the truck um, I like to do like cockpit drill and say everything that the vehicle can do and all the buttons, etc. We did, yeah, we didn't have to tip it the whole way through. I mean, when we done the four days in the car, I did ask him, I said, What's the, you know, it's a manual XC60, lovely car. Uh, we run on blues as well. And I said, What's the purpose of this? Like, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Going from a car that is very quick, yeah, going up to a big 30, 14 ton truck. Um, and he said, It's that system of when you get in a truck. Judging your speed by braking, that people tend to then their confidence goes up um, higher than their ability, and then they end up going around corners too fast. Yeah, which is a natural thing that can happen the longer you're driving. Putting them in the car in a manual car, they get rid of you doing um, gear brake overlap. Yeah, and they get you to get down to the speed you need to be for the roundabout, and yeah. then change gear. Mm. So I think it's more just a um, yeah, just to understand the controls of a car and a, a vehicle a bit better. So did you do um, a standard HGV thing first before you then went into your refad? You did that, yeah, yeah, so I've done that last year. How was Probably that? around the same, same how, time last year. How long was that? A week. How did you find it? Did you have to do it by yourself or did you do it with another person like learning at the same I, time? Yeah, I think I've done it with someone else. Yeah, I did, yeah. In Stevenage way, so it's in a different area. Because like you that just said there, a, when you're doing your response this time, you did it from 2 o'clock till 10 o'clock at night, eight hours of driving. Yeah, and funny enough, the guy, so I didn't do a solid eight hours. We obviously yeah, yeah. went round to different counties and we stopped at our, some of our stations for lunch and breaks and uh, a debrief after every 1.2 and 1.4 run and stuff like that. Um, yeah, the guy I was meant to be doing it with, this e flag course, got COVID, so it ended up just being me. Oh, man, that's um, brutal. Thanks for coming back and listening to the Firefighters Podcast. This one was brought to you by William Wood Watches. William Wood Watches, as I'm sure you're already aware, are the makers of those incredibly authentic watches with a piece of firefighting history in every single one. On the 9th of June, they created 250 beautiful limited edition pieces of the bravest watch for the FDNY Foundation. They're donating 15% from every single watch to the FDNY Foundation. And it's pretty incredible to see that William Wood Watches are now in the Rockefeller Center, the FDNY Fire Zone store that's held within Rockefeller Center on the 9th. 9th of June, they will be having one of their watches, which is going to press William Wood Watches into the history of FDNY. Johnny and the team are over there kicking ass and taking names. Be sure to join them on their journey. Head over to WilliamWoodWatches.com. Check them out on Instagram. Check them out on YouTube. You can check all of their watches right there from the Jubilee to the Triumph to the Valium to the Bronze to the Chivalrous. And they run competitions supporting firefighters charities all over the world, including the firefighters charity in the UK.
I really oh, struggled. Boy. I kept falling asleep in the back when I'd swap over. With the other I mean, I was. I was just being open. I, I am yeah. so... I'm driving bores me to tears. And if we're not on blues, I'm you, with the greatest respect to lorry oh, yeah. drivers, I'm like a glorified lorry driver. And I'm like, I hate this. I just hate it. Yeah. You know, I'm lucky enough that in my role now, I don't drive anymore. But I maintain the skill set in case because of like COVID or strikes or whatever, whatever, we need to go on the pumps. But don't enjoy it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I was quite keen to do it. I'm, mm. what, my 33 now. I had my, like, yearly appraisal. yearly review with yeah. the watch manager, appraisal, that's it. And he sort of said, you know, what do you want to do? Um, and I said, we really want to do my driving. He was like, ah, they might not go for it at this point in time. And, I, and funny enough, we we were desperate for them now. Mate, had- absolutely. Everybody should do it. I uh, It was always a dream of mine. I think any anybody that says they don't have an ambition to drive a fire engine, that is just BS. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Every, I wanted to yeah. do it, mate. I absolutely loved it. When I started doing it, absolutely loved it. The yeah. positioning, the high riding positioning when you're out there on the road, it's absolutely awesome. And you're <laughs> right. So this is a this is like a really important thing, and I want, I want to ask you about this probably, is we don't pay an enhancement to drivers. Um, I don't believe, and I'm, I'm stretching now, but I don't think anywhere in the UK Fire and Rescue Service do we pay. Whereas in America and stuff like that, it's an additional skill set. You know, if you're a driver, it's an enhancement because you are taking a lot more risk. And we're starting to find ourselves in a bit of a position now in the UK Fire Service where we're getting a lot of recruits that don't, strangely enough, some of them don't even drive. I mean, we actually made a mistake in my brigade. We we did forgot to say that it was a mandatory expectation that you have a driving license before, and even now, right? No, no, you can you can join without a driving license as long as you commit to getting one within the first six or twelve months, which is in itself an absolute ridiculousness. Because if I employ you now, a UK Fire and Rescue Service, I'm going to spend maybe thirty k on you just to get you trained and up to spec i'm going to fit you for all your ppe i'm going to put you through admin and all that cost and create you as an employee on my books i'm going to set you your everything up i'm going to set your blooming pension up and everything like that and then you've got six months of the if you don't do it what i'm what am i gonna do i'm gonna sack you am i yep. don't think you will <laughs> <laughs> you, you haven't got enough people no. um, but we can't make people do it so there's a bunch of people now especially when um, drivers are getting pinged or you know they're having little incidents here and there where people are like you know what i don't fancy driving anymore and people just throw their tickets in and you're like we're gonna have to we're gonna have to create an incentive for people to actually want to drive oh yeah i mean they were um as i said before the, the three guys in the driver training section of fed fire because it's all done in house um, you've got Paul Tracy, who the other two say hands down is the best driver trainer in the country. He yeah. um, used to work at police driver training school, whatever it's called. And they're all lovely. Um, and when we're going through the theory stuff at the beginning of the week, he said, right, you see this link here? He said, that takes you to um, the driving at work policy. He said, it's about that thick. He said, just have a little look over that at some point. In the case, you saying, obviously, we it's a skill and there's a bigger risk because if something happens while you're out there on that road, yeah. you're going to want to know what it says in there because it'll be one of these things where if you end up, something happens on the road and you end up getting taken to court. If you get off and no no charge, the governors, group commanders and that will have their arm around your shoulder going, never had any, never doubted you. Never doubted you. Had you about if, you get, <laughs> if you get If you get done for it, they won't want anything to do with you. They won't be seen in anything. <laughs> Oh, they won't be man. covering you. Pessimist. Pessimist. No, you're right, mate. You're right. And that's where that's what he said. is and I think we should acknowledge people because it's tough, you know. I mean, especially just I mean, on call and all whole time, but certainly your whole time where you know pump gets called out and you're going somewhere in the middle of the night or you just swap in stations because you need to send a cover pump there. Everybody else piles on and falls asleep. And then the driver <clears> drives you forty minutes in that direction. You know, and has to, has to be awake all the time, and blah, blah 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 blah. I think it's a massive demand on that. Per- and like you say, the risk aspect to it, as from myself, like as an incident commander, all you can ask the other person to do is stop. If you think they're driving dangerously, you can tell them to stop. I I should never, I don't, <laughs> but you I do say incident commanders who drive as well, who micromanage driving. You know, and they'll be like, oh mate, you need to slow down a bit, or you need to do this a bit, or you know, we need to make progress, or. You know, that's where it's a real self-confidence thing where individuals need to be able to say, "Yeah, I'm driving. Yeah, I'm, I'm driving. I've passed my driving thing. And unless I do something dangerous, 
you you they're not they shouldn't be leaning over and i think it's a yeah. it's a hell of a demand it's a hell of a responsibility for drivers yeah um big big learning. uh trust isn't it you've got faith in that truck you know what it's capable of yeah um and obviously it's different so for instance you go to your initial BA course. You've never worn BA before, but you're on your initial BA course. You get taught how to wear BA and how to go into the risk area. It's a new skill. You've got that added thing with driving. Of you've got a load of bad habits, so that starts <laughs> getting picked up. You've got to yeah. work your way out of them. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you go into a risk area. Yes, you've got the unknown of if you're going to house fire, how's the fire going to react? You know, but you obviously get taught that. What you can't control is what people are going to do when they see blue lights behind them on the road or in front of mm. you, and they end up stopping side by side. And mate, and for a lot of people, like it's that. just white noise as well, you know. And this was something I actually wanted to ask you about because I didn't necessarily speak about it prior to coming on. But this aspect of how busy and hectic life is nowadays, compounded with everybody's fears and anxieties and their lack of ability to hold attention with certain things, when they hear or when they um or when just blue lights when we're going up behind people now do you ever feel even just when you were observing from, from the back seat or anything like that people just don't seem to respond in the same way that they used no. to people are just oblivious it's just white noise yeah. to them yeah it's crazy i mean i've even done it um i know where you know prior to this i might have been on a dual carriage and obviously a bit more knowledge now i know that generally the two tones get turned off on dual carriage because you can't hear them anyway so we're going backwards yeah, and I used to think sometimes I've been caught out with police up my house, and I'm going, oh god, I couldn't even hear them, you know, <laughs> gone out of the way. <laughs> um, but then there's the others that sort of they can't make up, they see it, and they either sort of stop uh, or they'll go drop down to thirty mile an hour and just keep going with their indicator on, like go past. It's like you're looking, for, <laughs> you're looking for that reaction, aren't you? And obviously, you should give them the benefit of the doubt. They don't know what we want them to do, yeah. but for us, it's best if they just completely stop and we can work our way through isn't it so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, i uh, i heard a great analogy from uh, a driving instructor and he uses this thing about stick down the river i don't know if uh, your driver you did that have you heard that before it was no. a great analogy right you never play poo sticks you know where you stand on a bridge and drop a stick you ever played that game yeah yeah yeah, yeah, poo yeah. Sticks. you drop a stick and then you watch it go down the river he talks about driving in that capacity so he says, as an emergency services driver, you should never stop, theoretically. You know, that's a profound exaggeration. Some people, if you need to stop, it's dangerous, stop. But you should never stop. You should be part in the waves. As you know, you should be anticipating things, you know, 30, 40 seconds ahead of you, giving them those indications. Like you've said, you know, okay, blue lights are on. Okay, I'm getting a response. I'm going to get a response. No, they're within my window. I'm going to pip them with the tones. Tones go on, single set of tones. Okay, I've got a response. Tones go off. I change my position and I'm anticipating something coming the other way. I'm moving over far enough to, to you know, isolate the gap so people don't keep proceeding. And it's that. The whole idea of the stick down the river is it should just glide through nice yeah. and slowly. It should just be gliding through. It shouldn't get up behind something and have to stop that should never be the case you should be anticipating anticipating it and even when you're like rolling into you know re, you know a clear red light crossroads or something like that you should be fully anticipating and coming right down okay 15 10 5 counting the yeah. junctions one two moving back out two tones come off take speed back up back up to third fourth and away you go yeah. and that's just that seamless um slow is smooth smooth is fast do you know what i mean yeah. versus people that bang on the anchors, scream, shout, get out of the way, lean out the window, move, we need to make progress, you know, yeah. bu bullying people through junctions, which is just dangerous because people assume that we've got some sort of special rules. People don't realise that we're actually exempt. Uh, so we're not exempt from anything, are we? We, we actually follow no. all of the same rules that everybody else follows. Yeah. Um, and there's just a few contraindications depending on the situation. But you know, like you say, you have, no, you have no right of way as such, you have no priority, you can't force people into junctions, um, no. or anything like that and and i think we're getting um we're getting into a position where it can be a little bit scary because like you say the public aren't reacting in the same way that they used to and um i do worry about it especially as it's becoming less and less attractive to people we need to find a way of uh making it a little bit more appealing but like you say people such as yourself clearly still yeah. interested in doing it so uh we can't be doing it all wrong i wanted to have you on no, again because no, um we've uh we've spoke before uh I love the last conversation that we had, but something that I just wanted to, to catch people up on is the fact that you've <clears> now been running a successful podcast for probably over are you over you're over a year now, aren't you? Did you say, did you say successful? Well, yes, <laughs> Jesus. 
<laughs> self belief. You know, that's, man, you have run a successful podcast. You know, I, I know it, people that have spoke, people, people that don't know I know you. I have heard, have heard yeah. of it and listened to it. Um, and I think that's really admiring right. because there's so many people who started up podcasts during lockdown. I was looking at some um, Ofcom stats recently and it says that roughly one in five people listen to a weekly podcast and 70% of those people um, listen to like discussion case um, discussion based podcasts, which obviously includes yours. But despite the industry that's still growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, um, a lot of people haven't continued doing it past uh, the end of lockdown i think it was kind of a knee-jerk reaction for a lot of people um to get their businesses going that they started a podcast of some form but through their own challenges or whatever they've decided not to to continue with it and i wonder if there's something that is specific about the fact that you do the guest-based podcast and the fact that it is focused in and around so much of the you know the breaking out of purgatory the mental health challenges that people are facing and the fact that we know talking about these issues makes it much more accept uh much more receptive to people and allows people to sort of feel free to have those discussions. How have you found it since you started? Yeah, it's been um it's been like I say, we're in a funny world at the moment with COVID. It hasn't gone away and it's now coming back and back with a vengeance. Round three. Yeah. Round three. <laughs> That's crazy, mate. Crazy. <laughs> I mean, the very first idea I had to do it was actually before lockdown. Um I don't think we're in full lockdown and I might, I might have said it to you before. Uh, I approached my cousin who still isn't really in a position that he wants to come and do something like this and talk about mental health. Um, and my mate, Mark, that was the plan, you know, thinking of, I don't know, true Geordie and stuff like that. I, in my head, I'm like <laughs> that studio round a table, yeah. you know, it'd be, it's a serious subject, but we should also be able to have a laugh and, and, and have a chat and, and stuff like that. It, it, and I, like I, said, I, I didn't have a plan out what I was doing or how I did it or how to set up recording or anything like that. So I just went about it, started uh, getting more contact as I went through. Um, obviously, it, most videos I do where I'm uh, thanking supporters and stuff like that. You know, I've got a, a more recent one, Bigger Box Productions have been helping me out. Um, another fellow firefighter you know you so convent have all been that's the thing that's hit me the most is how nice the community is a quick reminder for all of our listeners of our monthly giveaway now as part of our partnership with hikes rosenbauer and tallyman we give away that little bit extra to our podcast listeners every single month you can get two personalized ba tallies these are hard wearing they've got your own name on them, your own service number on them and they have the podcast logo on the back and then for the juicy stuff hikes give away a pair of their incredible footwear and some of the stuff is pretty expensive stuff to be honest with you we try and switch in and change it every month we are guided by the gods of hikes to make sure we are giving you exactly what you need for that time of year so it might be boots it might be trainers and then once every quarter our good friends over at Rosenbauer are giving away their Boris B5 Firefine boots as well so to be in with a chance to win jump over to our social media platforms or YouTube where you need to tag a member of the emergency services in the post be following our page and you will be in with a chance to win at the end of every single month back to the show oh, it's and how good it is yeah, it's brilliant. Well. I love it. It's like a global yeah. village. I absolutely love it. There's so many incredible yeah. people out there that when, like you say, when you lift out the box. But given that it's based around mental health, is there something about that aspect of, like you say, you intended to start with other people and we were going to have this adventure and you still are having your own adventure, but, you know, yeah. obviously I, I do a lot of this sort of stuff and sometimes you feel, do you feel like you're speaking into the void? You know, you're not on a stage at the end of the day. You are, <laughs> you're, speak, oh, you're speaking I'm, into the abyss. 100%. I mean, I felt like after mid of my EPEV, I released that episode last week where I sort of talked about what I was planning to do. Um, obviously, a meeting up with you, doing an episode with you, mm. um, what I wanted to achieve next year. And I, I videoed it as well, and I thought, I'm going to take some clips from that. And I just thought, you know, I had that down moment for sort of 20 minutes. I thought, nah, I'm not putting that up. Like, who's going to listen to that? Um, How do you cope with those valleys? And yet, because that is a valley, mate. And like you yeah. say, you can find yourself in there. It feels like you're sitting in a puddle of shit, splashing it going out. Yeah, it's yeah, it's tough sometimes. Whatever, you know, whatever. I've got, I've probably got five or six people that I approached this year about doing episodes and some, some good ones as well. And they've either been put on the back burner because I haven't been dedicated enough time to this. I think it's what I said to my other half. I said, next year, like on one of my days off, I need to treat it as a work day for the podcast. Because at the minute I just sort of I'm at work, I'll have ten minutes, I'd love to do something with them, I'll message them. Yeah. Um 
and, and but the fact is, when I have done episodes, and for example, not even episodes, when I've done the swimming, um, the reception I got from that blew me away. Like, I never expected. Just double click on that because I know we've had you on before, but I don't think, and obviously we shared a lot of the content that you did just before. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but just double click on what you did because I thought that was fairly colossal because you spent a couple of, it was 24 hours or a couple of days. Tell people what you did. Uh, so basically, uh, swim for dementia for outside society. You could pick any challenge you wanted. I mean, you could swim a mile, and it was over thirty days, so you could. I mean, but even if you do, so I picked ten miles. Over thirty days is twenty twenty six lap twenty six mm. length a day, mm. um, which I knew from the start. That's why initially when I looked at, it, I thought there's no way I'm going to get to a swim pool every day. I know because I've got work. I'm on call. I've got the kids, clubs, all that sort of stuff. I thought there's no way. Um, I ended up doing it, I think it was seven, maybe a few more, maybe nine days I've done it. Um, which, it, with everything, and this is at a time when I, I, it wasn't just my work, I had stuff going on at home, it was a stressful time, um, which is why I didn't get more than ten and a half miles. So I reached the target, I was pleased I did that, and we raised a lot of money for the good cause. Um, but the relief once I'd reached that was like, because obviously I'd, done a lot of posts about it i'm going to be doing this challenge this that and the other that's it for me to then i, I know you know some things are more important but for me i put that out there i needed to do it public accountability it. it's really um, good it's really good to do it so got that done and i thought okay i'd love to do another 10 miles in the 15 20 days i've got left or wherever it is but actually there's something else that needs my focus right now um how did so, you find so it when, you, when you're doing all that swimming? Because speaking about, there's something I made a note about, which we're going to talk to you about later, but it's relevant now, is I, I when I've had bouts of different things in my life, and we've, we've spoke a little bit about the valleys that you pass through at different times, I often think about feeling underwater when you have those moments, because, it again, it's about that sort of screaming into the void. It's a bit like you're shouting underneath the film of something that no one else can hear. And that, that, mm. for, that for me, I, I, I've never wanted to do... Well, actually, that's a, that's a lie. I've wanted to do some sort of swim challenges and stuff like that, but I don't like the idea of being alone with my thoughts for a prolonged period of time like that because I know you can get some Gucci headphones and all that sort of stuff where people listen to stuff when they're swimming, but it's a very, very solo, isolated, um, strange way to do it. Have you ever heard of, of mental health challenges compared to something like that? Because it's something I heard somebody else say. It wasn't my word. Someone else said it, and when they said it, I thought, God, you're right. A little bit like if you were sat on the bottom of a pool screaming and no one can hear what what's going on and i think you know having having been addicted to things in the past and that, that's kind of like a secret secret superpower as to how i tend to be able to apply myself to things because it's actually a bit of a sickness i do it so that i don't spend a lot of time um 100 i get it, it. <laughs> do you know what i mean was yeah, there anything in that I, um, when you looked at that swimming it yeah it wasn't what's the word it was i wouldn't it wasn't fun um i'm I had a lot to concentrate on because I can swim. I've got no problem swimming. I can throw the kids in the pool and I can swim. I've done the odd length here or there before, but I'm like, I haven't got a technique. I don't, I've now, I haven't done swimming since I, I think I was in lower school last time. I've done proper swimming. So I was sort of learning on the job and I thought that it's not meant to be easy. And for those that maybe look at it and go, he's only doing 10 miles, that's easy for someone who can swim the breaststroke properly and stuff like that. I was just going in with it yeah. and giving my best. So the majority of the time I had that, I was just trying to focus on being better each time I went in, going a bit further. I had the watch. So that for me was a challenge. Right. Tonight I'm going to go further than, than I did last night, yeah. whatever. Um, but yeah, you know, I, obviously I had a personal reason for doing the challenge as well, which was for my nan who's suffering with dementia. So I suppose I, I carried quite a bit of guilt through that challenge as well because along through COVID, I hadn't seen her. And it literally to the point where before COVID, when I saw her, she knew who I was. When I went back, she didn't. Um, so, and also my granddad, you know, my granddad wanted to see, probably wanted to see his grandkids uh, or great grandkids. Um, and he hadn't seen them. But with COVID and that, we didn't want to go around and risk her getting worse or getting COVID. And that's what this, this has done to us. So, I had a lot, yeah, I had a lot of stuff I was thinking about and then I had my own stresses in the final few days of it that I had going on at home. Um, whether or not it's healthy or not is another matter, but 
I just try and get my head down and try and uh, try and define health because you know you you made a point there and we don't want to make this into a COVID conversation by any stretch of the imagination but I think the um, the counter cost of so many things is uh, rarely ever quantified and the COVID's a wonderful example because we speak about the cost being we've got to do this otherwise people are going to die okay yeah okay I get that it's very easy to understand it's not easy to do like so many things but it's easy to understand but we don't have the counter cost we don't we don't look at the counter cost which is i've got you know i've got a daughter i've got two of the boys you've got two young girls what's the cost there you know the cost uh impact on their development the cost impact on a friend of mine um similar to yourself as his mom uh with the grand his granddad passed away a couple of years ago so his mom's been on her own for quite some time and uh when this whole thing started he was going around dropping, you know, groceries off at the end of the driveway and all that sort of jazz. And she was sort of ringing them from the bloody house and they were in the car. And, oh, Granny, yeah, how are you doing? You're right, yeah, yeah, what have you been up to? Blah, blah, blah. And she said to him, maybe two or three months into it, you know, how long do you think this is going to be going on? And he said, oh, well, I, I, I don't know. You know, two or three months later, still having the same conversation. And she said, I don't know if I, if I want to live like this, you know. So the cost of me coming yeah. out of this, and I'm not encouraging anybody to throw caution to government guidance or anything like that, but the cost of me coming out of this might be that I might catch something that may or may not um, bring my life to an early end. But she says, if this is living, I'm not sure I want to live like this. You know, I'm not sure I wouldn't rather risk it because if I can exist without having contact with anybody else, is is that really an existence? A little bit like the old saying, you know, a life a life lived without love isn't life at all. You know, a life yeah. that you've lived without any contact with anybody else. We're designed to have contact with each other. You know, we're we're chemically designed. That that you know, or oxytocin. You know, everything that pulls us together. That's why we're pack animals. We want to be together. We chemically get yeah. rewarded for doing it. So, you know, trying to sustain an existence where we don't have regular contact is kind of it's kind of a betrayal of our base instincts. And when she said that, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, she later just wore a mask everywhere and started engaging with the children because she was like I'd rather live six months you know like, yeah. like this than another 10 years on my own and, and I think half the problem with that and I, I'm not going to go into into the government stuff too much because um, no doubt it's been a challenging time for decision making and stuff like that of over the has. last couple of years we have a very very luxurious place to sit on the sidelines and throw stones so that's not what we're doing no and I just think we we never get the facts anymore. We never, or people never know the facts, or there's always misinformation out there everywhere you look. Um, so we're at this stage where everyone's like, either it's not as serious as they're making out, or whatever. So I'm not I'm not bothered. And then there's the others that are just like I've spent two years locked down. I'm not doing it again. So my other half, who was we were probably more cautious than most when it first came around. I think. Uh, five days before they'd done the Christmas lockdown last year, whatever it was, we both said, actually, do you know what? Because we'd done homeschooling during lockdown so much anyway, and they were saying there's going to be lockdown coming, we just pulled them out. And they said, the schools haven't been shut yet. And we're like, yeah, we're bringing them home because my wife's very good at doing homeschooling. And it's come up to Christmas. We'd rather not risk it. But I could see a similar thing happening this year. And she's like, no, I'm not doing it again. Her mum's older, uh, a generation older than my mum, really. So she's like, no, I'm not. We're not doing it. We're not. And everyone's just fed up of it, aren't they? You know hey, I mean? I'm the like, same. They... I am the same. I'm, honestly, mate. I'm, but again, I'm I'm a freak. You know, I'm not. I don't speak for the vast majority of the population. And this is not. I have a different opinion only because I have a different opinion with a lot of stuff. I'm ready for Mad Max. I mean, I'm, I'm ready for that, brother. I've got the gym and <laughs> and where I live and I take get, a leading role, mate. I get in ice baths every day. I am that guy. Okay, I'm living on the edge of the spectrum anyway. So. I would by no means encourage people to do a lot of the other stuff I do. And I believe it costs me a lot as well. You know, I've I've lived a fairly um, secluded life for a very long time. I always say to people, I'm, and I always get these two ones wrong, but I am social. I'm incredibly sociable, but I'm not social. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the podcast is a great example or anything like that. You put me in a group of people, I will be making friends with everybody. I will high five people on the bus on the way home. Do you know what I mean? You put me in a group, I will make friends straight away. I'll ask inquisitive questions, probably yeah. to the extent that will annoy them. I, I love being around people, but I don't actively seek it by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. A perfect day to me 
is spent in almost complete seclusion. You know, I'll go to the gym, I'll train some clients, I'll have a chat with a few people, but I will spend 80% of my day listening to audio books by myself, do the school run, cook for the kids, you know, do, do my gym stuff, do my podcast stuff and do the fire service stuff. I don't want that, that other aspect of it because so many people are engaging with all that noise that I just, I just can't engage with. And I think that, I mean, you, you would have seen from some of my posts in that, and I think I even said it to you on the podcast before, consistency for me, whether it's the podcast yeah. or whether it's going to the gym, um, because since I've had that time off sick and been doing the driving and stuff like that, I mean, I've shrunk. But um, the consistency for me I, is something I'm still seeking. And maybe that way you go about your daily business, you know, you got your family balance. Because to me, it looks like you're churning out podcasts all the time, like good quality podcast episodes as well. With these guests, I don't know how you find all these guests. <laughs> then, I just annoy everybody um, until they say yes. No, no. We, we, we've, we've turned the we're tired now. A lot of people send a lot of emails in, but go on, sorry. And then obviously your PT, um, and I know you're obviously your, your whole time and you've got family as well. Oh, we Sometimes do I get out and I'm like, how do I, how do I fit it in? You know, <laughs> I mean, three horses and we've got a caravan company and we've got a couple of dogs and yeah, we do know any stuff, but there's freedom in discipline. This is what I always say to yeah. people. If you don't apply discipline to yourself, life is going to apply it. All right, life is going to apply a shit ton of discipline if you do not impose it upon yourself. You know, it's, it's a great Stoic and monk philosophy about choose your misery. You know, you can have the misery of regret or you can have the misery of applying that constant discipline to yourself. But there's freedom in one of them. You know, yeah. there's freedom in self discipline. Learn to discipline yourself so that you don't have to be reactive. You're not like a tree in the wind that's constantly adapting to the blowing gales of left and right. Yeah. You are grounded. You've driven those roots. You've you've dug and dug and dug with your goddamn teeth and your fingernails to get that discipline in place to the extent yeah. that you've then got so much freedom around it because you've got these columns. You've got these absolute columns in your life that yeah. You know, you, you don't allow yourself to, to be blustered around by all the other all the other noise. Actually, I suppose it does actually lead us on to this report you sent me a yeah. few weeks back. <laughs> Sorry, and I've obviously been talking forty plus minutes. Yeah, no, no, it, yet. <laughs> the, the reason I say that is because there's a lot of stats in there, and this is when I obviously we talk about discipline when we're put into a pandemic scenario and frontline services are under a lot of strain and then you go to the individual each person how how they keep that discipline anyway if that, they might have been the most disciplined person in the world then all of a sudden they're being told we need you in a, you, we need you back in we need you back in we need you back in mm. and then obviously the extra levels of stress that come with that but, i mean i'll let you i'll let you lead on it you no, yeah, mate. well the, you know and i'll just double click on what you're saying there for one second which is that people have to be able to maintain a certain element of self-sufficiency I think you should have your own first aid kit for your mind. For I mean, it's all about discussions and it's all about gaining support from other people. But you should have a few go-to sustainable ways of balancing your life. Even just as small as like, I have a reset bag, right? So I've got a, a 511 tactical bag that carries all my stuff in it. You know, it's got it's got head torches. There's bloody masks in it at the minute, unfortunately. There's always a pack of rice cakes in there. There's always, a, you know, two two-liter bottles of water in there. There's backup phone chargers in there. There's my toothbrush in there. You know, I've always got a, a, a large amount of, well, not a large amount, probably shouldn't say that. I've got some cash in there. And, uh, there's a go a, bag. A it's a go bag, mate. And every time I yeah. get back, there's a spare pair of underwear in there. There's a towel in there. And every time I get back to the house, I reset. Do you know what I mean? Anything I've eaten, anything I've drank, there's a protein bar or something in there, I will reset that bag and I am good to go. Right. You know, I've always got a pair of trainers with me or something like that. So I could pretty much go anywhere. There's always a sleeping bag in the truck. And I'd be fine for a couple of days, whether I get called somewhere else. Um, and you have to have that self-sustaining mindset. You know, we've we've celebrated a lot of minimalism and stuff like that. And there's probably a balance somewhere in between where you don't want to be. I've got I know people that have got them in hydration packs underneath their car, and they've got the ability to live without water for a few days because they can recycle it. Almost. I'm not talking about swinging the pendulum to that extent, but you should be able to sustain your own life. You should be able to have a process of of looking after yourself physically, mentally, um, so that when, as you know, we echo back to that discipline, when things start going belly up and the water starts rising, can you swim? 
you know what I mean? Can you swim yeah. by yourself? Otherwise, you just start frantically flailing around and screaming and scrambling on top of each other. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing. People that have not disciplined themselves emotionally, financially, you know, and it's so uncomfortable, even just physically. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's so uncomfortable, this whole fat shaming stuff where people are like, oh, you know, well, you should be a little bit more fitter and healthy and you'll probably be all right. That's very offensive, isn't it, Pete? That's very rude. Well, so you've, you've had the advice for the last 40 years, you know, drink more water, you know, get exercise three times a week. This isn't rocket science, guys. We've gone from a time where, you know, we spent 80 years with a lack of food and nutrition and stuff like that. And now we're finally in a place where we have an abundance of food and we have an abundance of everything. Everything is an abundance and everything is disposable. And we just can't seem to stop ourselves. We just cannot yeah. stop ourselves. We overindulge on everything. And it does not just the physical aspects. We overindulge in technology. And it has a massive counter cost. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I wanted to get on to, because uh, you've had some incredible guests on, and I wanted to uh, ask you about some of the common themes uh, there's two favorite podcast episodes that you've done that I really do want to speak to you about and then another one perhaps later on it. if we get a chance. Um, the first was an episode you did back in June with a gentleman called Steve. Um, he was yep. funnily enough as a firefighter as well. Now, he'd spent about a decade of suffering with um, some verbal and, and some physical challenges that I wanted you to sort of try and expand on and he went into, you know, well, I remember listening back to it, it was in a pretty dark place at, uh, at one point in time. Steve was a contact I got through the brigade. He's actually... He wasn't an uh, operational firefighter. He's a um, what do do? property maintenance there. Yeah. Um, in Bed Fire, um, and he won't mind me. He won't mind me talking about it. Um, but yeah, he. he I don't remember if it was his, I think it was his second relationship, um, and just it was all good for a few years. Happy, happy, no, no problems whatsoever. And then I, I think they were trying for a child. I, I'm not sure he was overly on board but he he loved her and he you know he wanted to make her happy and so they they sort of came to that mm -hmm. um decision that yeah okay let, let's try it and and it, and it didn't it didn't happen um and then it in the stress from that happening it, it quickly turned and he started being getting abused emotionally i suppose initially um and then it ju it just cascaded from there i mean i think he was i mean Cigarettes flicked at him. I think he got pushed down the stairs at, at some point in time. Um, it, yeah, it wasn't a good, wasn't a good time. And all this time happening, he didn't, he didn't talk to anyone. It's obviously the maid into having him on talking about that. Um, him coming forward for the brigade and and talking about it, um, knowing that all his colleagues and that are going to hear it for the first time and not know anything about it is like, yeah. you know, what what a guy. I think it's a lot more common than people think it is as well, though, because male pride and those aspects there, it, we almost feel like we're losing face in our community if we do reach out for help, especially with something such as that. But it's, uh, it's a really difficult thing to even comprehend because I, I imagine, not I imagine, but, you know, just speaking for myself, I've never been put in a position where I've had to worry about that sort of physical violence from, from a loved yeah. one. And it's such a, yeah. such a counter thing for somebody you've been so vulnerable with as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, he he talked so honestly about it uh, when we were talking. Then even uh, there was another person in the room actually um, from Occupational Health who turned up, and I I didn't know they were coming. <laughs> and the whole idea was that he's telling his story for the first time. You know, we hadn't actually met in person wow. until that time. So, but he, in fairness to me, he cracked on, and carried on. How did you handle um, that pressure? Because that must have been intense for you. It must have been a bit surreal. It. it it was, and you know, I, I tried to stick to the fact that okay, I might not be the world's best interviewer and know the right things to say, but one, I hope that then it comes across as genuine, and two, as long as I'm respectful and treat him with dignity, then hopefully I will come across okay talking to him, and it won't be. Did you hear what he said to that bloke when he just said he tried to take his own life? You know, did you see his face or something like that? At the end of the day, we're all um, not all majority of us are all decent human beings aren't we and as long as we treat other human beings with respect. that's why i think what you do is, um, is so um powerful because you know I, yeah i talk to people about loads of different stuff but you know what some of it is really safe ground you know what i mean we're talking yeah. about the pumps or we're talking about i'm talking to a paramedic about something or i'm talking to a chief of police or a chief fire officer about something you know what they are bang smack in the middle of their comfort zone yeah i mean public speaking yeah. is is fairly scary for a lot of people but 
you are navigating thin ice at times, not in like a in like a professional capacity of oh god, is he going to yeah. say something that's going to get him sacked? But you're dealing with a very you, you know people trust you with some very delicate stories, and I, I think that must that would create a lot of pressure for some people in feeling that you've been trusted to to you know handle somebody's story and deliver that to the world. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, it means a lot that he uh, came on to the podcast, from, you know, and and gave his story to me and then others. Um, you know, it's I, my overriding thought is how how is he just it, from go, not talking at all, and then how has he just spilled the beans to me? Um, I don't know if you you may I, I done another episode recently with a young lad, Kieran. Yeah, I heard Kieran's one. Yeah, I done my initial talk with, and. I don't know. I, I didn't put a lot of the video on, so I don't know how it sounded across on the, uh, the whole thing on um, on audio. But he got quite emotional when he started talking about he's not sure. Yeah, I know. Because of what his partner's going through, he doesn't know how to say what he's feeling. You know, mm. new dad, young new dad doesn't. Know. And he, it, his face when when I looked at him, it looked like he was you know really struggling. Mm. And again, after it, he said to me, "I'm just." I really appreciate actually, you, you know, us having a chat and, you know, that's all I, it's if crazy, we can just it? keep doing that, yeah. especially, I mean, I know you are obviously going to go on to uh, Lisa's story in a minute, but when I interview men and they talk the first time, if we can keep doing that, then that's a win. And, and ultimately that's what I want to do. I also want to talk to people who are doing the amazing work as well. Like I said on uh, last week's episode, um, mm. talking to chums who are doing stuff with kids. Uh, mental health and um how do you navigate that yourself as well though because i often feel when when pe- I've, you know, I've had guests on who do who take you down similar rabbit holes and sometimes it takes me by complete surprise because it's not necessarily something we intended on speaking about but like you say when you get into a conversation with people and they feel that they can trust you and you start de- developing a lot of empathy a lot of sympathy a lot of rapport with that person mm. some stuff just starts coming out of the closets and you have yeah. to kind of catch it as it falls out um because i often think especially when i listen to some of your stuff somebody is somebody's going through or they've been through a battle or it's a little bit like going around somebody's house and you go, hello, mate, you know, you want to, uh, you're saying you had a problem in the cellar. And they go, yeah, let's go for a walk, mate. And they take you on a yeah. story yeah, down into the valley. They take you on a story down into the cellar. And it's a little bit like, there's a kind of an overarching holistic view when we talk about the emergency services as a whole. You onboard some of that. You have to, you have to to be there in the moment with them and still sustain a connection, <clears throat> you have to onboard that that trauma to a certain extent. Otherwise, if you if yeah. you weren't connecting with the person, then you, you wouldn't be able to sustain the conversation. Similar to an incident, you have to go somewhere. And even though you're not the one in the car crash, you're not the one in losing their house, you're not the one who's just seen, seen a partner you know lose their life, you are there with them. You are onboarding yeah. that trauma. And how, how did you balance that? Because you've been very open about some of the challenges that you faced. You're onboarding that trauma every time think, you have a conversation. I think probably it's um, on, on some aspects it's relatable to stuff I've gone through. So to that, I know already one how they might be feeling, and two how how it how it can affect you. Um, I mean, I, I've gone down routes of being a mental health first aider and doing a mental health awareness course. You know, not it's nothing to shout about their entry level courses um because I, I do want that balance of i want to educate myself a bit more on what mental health is what what we need to do to make things better and what certain conditions can come with and certain disorders can give you but like i've even if me and uh, me and beck might be having a conversation about something and she'll say oh don't talk to me like a mental health first aid you know or something like that <laughs> and i'm like oh stop diagnosing me matt stop diagnosing yeah, me but, and, and that's that I don't want to fall into that trap of interviewing people and then they're going, are you a counsellor now? You know, Mate, it's not hard, you I can't switch it off. I um, have it. I have it yeah. with uh, with line manager. I don't necessarily spend a lot of time with my line manager just because of how our structure uh, fits. But when I sit with them, um, every couple of minutes, they'll probably go, nah, I don't want you coaching me, Pete. Or they'll say, you know, I don't know. No, I'm, I'm here for your benefit. <laughs> you know, I'm here for your benefit. Yeah. And I'll, I'm just, you know, I'm just... I am sincerely interested in people though. And you are as well, you know, and when you are sincerely interested in people, yeah. you, you do develop in a subconscious art of the way you ask questions. Yeah. It's, um, I didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, you know, I 
say enjoy loosely because obviously sometimes you do have to hear some tough stuff. But like I said to you about interviewing other people, interesting people. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of he's got a Facebook page, uh, Newfoundland. Yeah, he's got the he's got the big dog, Pete. Newfoundland dog. Pete. Pete. So he was in the magazine, uh, Merchant Services magazine, a little while yeah, ago. And that's yeah, the first yeah. time I saw him. So I reached out to him and said, "Is this?" Uh, helping people with PTSD with friends. and to me like I love my dog stuff like that I was like this is amazing what he's doing you know so I reached out to him and uh, that's one of the ones that I haven't chased back up to sort out um, but just people that are doing amazing stuff you know what I mean like yeah. I just want to talk to you ever met people that are doing that and then did you meet him I haven't no oh he's a lovely guy I've uh, spent I've spent time with the dogs. I think he had about nine at one point in time. Yeah, yeah, uh, massive, massive things. So uh, there's something to do with the way their skin is and how thick their hair is. They effectively create an additional flotation capacity when they get in the water. And you can, you know, I could literally climb on one of those dogs right. and they don't sink. And they're fantastic. He's done drills with them yeah. where he will tow back in a boat. He can tow people back in. Yeah. And he does a lot of work with children uh, with learning difficulties and helping them learn to swim. It's such a, it's an amazing stuff that he's doing because um, obviously he, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people that work with him are, are in the emergency services. He's got obviously a past in the emergency services himself. He's got paramedics and firefighters that work with him. And they're gorgeous animals. They're bloody massive. They're all at the emergency services show. There's about four of them there. Yeah. Yeah, just so I talk about his community. Do you know what I mean? Like, you yeah, know him. He's such uh, an incredible guy. He built a swimming yeah. pool for them during lockdown. Did he? For the dogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with a ramp with a ramp to go up yeah. and get in because uh, they're so big. You don't want them no, jump, I... jumping up and down. They just smash their hips to death. But he is such an incredible guy. Um, you said that, you know, when we were talking about um, Steve's story, um, I always, uh, you know, it, it, no matter how empathetic you are, uh, I feel like it can be difficult, if not impossible, to truly understand what it's like to go through suicidal ideation unless you've experienced it yourself. So it's not surprising that, you know, as a species, we have a, you know, we have a, a visceral desire. We have a strong survival instinct. And it's hard to see how anyone who hasn't gone through it themselves could understand somebody's desire to die, somebody's desire to end their life. And this is something you have spoken to people about. What have been some of the common themes when you've been having those discussions? Honestly, I don't understand it. I still don't understand it fully because I, the lowest point I've probably been at was when I had pissed all my money up the wall. Me and Beck weren't together anymore. I had a six-month-old daughter and I was in some grubby little house I was living in around the corner from their house that I was just paying a mate for to stay there. But I had no, I think I had like a chair in the living room. Joey, like, is that bad? But I can only, and I, th I always, I sometimes wonder why when I then talk to other people who have been in similar situations. I'm, I can honestly, hand on heart, say I've never, ever considered suicide, ever. And I think I was really low at some point, you know. I'd, but I can't understand why. I don't. Part of me thinks I'd be too scared to, scared of death to do it, you know. Um, but the most people part say, you know, I mean, I think for Steve he'd reached the lowest of lows and um, no one knew about it. He didn't want to, and he felt like he's not worth anything to anyone and he'd be better off if he just wasn't here. Um, it, it's a funny thing, the mind, isn't it? How you can get that low that actually you can't see any other way out than actually just ending it do and thinking that everyone would be better off if you go. Do you ever think about it in reverse? And what I mean by that is, so the other side of it is, do you fear death of other people? I your children or your partner? Do I? Yeah. Have you ever um, have you ever gone through the process of what you would do if you lost a child or if you or if your partner died? God forbid. I I haven't overly overly I haven't really considered it. I mean, I think about it regularly. Had, do you? Yeah. Might seem a bit dark to people. <laughs> no, I mean it. So you're I, don't, I don't mean like doing it myself. I don't linger with my partner at the top of the stairs and go, eh, it's fancy. <laughs> but it, no, I think I mean, it, it gives you a different perspective. You know, when I kiss my daughter goodnight or, you know, I go in and she's asleep or something like that, I look at her and I think, what would life be like if you died tomorrow? What would be like? You know, you hear about, I, I uh, spoke to somebody a long time ago who had their son. <laughs> I get this right. It's called Sads. Sudden adult death syndrome. Have you heard of that? Yep. 
Yeah, because you have it with children as well. Um, it's also known as cot death in a similar way, where there's an yeah, yeah. Un, you know you don't know why somebody's passed away, but they've just passed away, and there was yeah. no there's no trauma as such. And I I that kind of helped me come to terms with it because people say, oh, well, how is your kid going? They might just be gone. And I like to go through that mental process because it helps me to appreciate people. You know, when you worry about all the stupid small stuff or your kid's done this or your kid's drawn on a wall or whatever, it doesn't mean you just let them do whatever you want, but it kind of grounds me. And I always think of this when we go to instances where you go to a house and the house is just absolutely just unreal how the level of deprivedness that people, you know, the socioeconomic level and just the way that they're living and the way that people are treating each other. And you think, how has it gotten to this situation? Because people took stuff for granted and the, the small little things soon became the big things and they forgot about the reason they ever started out together, you know? So I I regularly remind myself that we're not here forever. One day you are going to die. My partner, my children may die before me, you know, I yeah. might die, but I'm not really that bothered if I die because I'm not going to know about it. So it is irrelevant. Yeah. It's going to be a pain that everybody else has to go through. I'm not saying that I'm super important. You know, it won't be a packed church, but uh, yeah. they're going to have to go through it. Whereas I think I think people should familiarize them. They should flirt with the idea and they should at least think about um, you know that, that, that morbidity, that fact that we are not here forever. No, and I mean, I, I, I don't have it anymore, but I know when I was younger, I could be in bed and I could think about and it would be one day I used to picture myself looking down on earth right and thinking it's looking for me and I'm not there anymore yeah that was when I was you know when I was a teenager and stuff like that I used to well, I used to get my heart racing laying in bed yeah and I couldn't it almost it was almost like a panic attack I'm like that, that don't make sense to me like because obviously when you start looking up and out and past everything it's like okay but where does it go? I mean, we could go into a whole other conversation Mate, on this. We are but, but a whisper of a blink I mean? of a hiccup of time <laughs> in space. Do you know what I mean? We are so insignificant. It is, And that helps me conceptualize stuff. Lisa, yeah. I wanted to ask you about Lisa because yeah, yeah. Um, she had an incredible story uh, about her brother Paul, uh, unfortunately, taking his life. And for people that haven't heard it, um, give us the whistle. No, it sounds horrible. Give us a whistle stop tour of uh, Lisa's story because that was quite a surreal one to listen to. Yeah, um, Lisa, is, she's absolutely lovely. She doesn't fall off much, actually. Um, and she's a friend of the family and you know, our kids are friends. And just she'd heard, I'd started the podcast, I think she'd spoken to my half and said about, that was one of the first interviews I'd done, really. So it was pretty terrifying. I remember having the um, as many notes as I could up, up on the wall behind me, like just with scribbles on it, you know. Yeah. Um, and she come on and again, it was really the first time she'd spoken about it in detail to anyone. Um, and it was a tough, to be honest, it was just one of those, he, he'd always had his issues over the years with depression and, and things like that, I think. And that, that was a hard one for me to listen to because I know, uh, Lisa's daughter or daughters, mm. um, and hearing how close they were, um, over the years and when she was growing up and she was only a little girl anyway. Um, and it got, it got too much for him and, and he took his own life and that was, to, how old was he? I think he was 30, 35. I'm trying to remember now. No, I think he was, um, I think he was 33, yeah. but yeah, it was there. Or thereabouts. Uh, yeah. It's similar to my age. Um, scary, isn't it? Yeah, it is scary. And I think I've said to her in person since like, you know, it's not old, you know, but this, the numbers are there. I mean, we've talked, she talks quite openly about the things she'd learned about it since and, and stats of men under 50 and it's the biggest killer, you know, it's, it's mm. a real thing. It's not uh, some silly stat that, you know, that is a fact. Mm. Under 50 year olds, the biggest killer is suicide. Mm. So that leads you on to what the hell are we doing wrong? Like, mm. how can we, how can we change this? stigma that's surrounded it um and it needs to start from us talking about it more i mean you you and me could talk about physical health all day long you know i'm not i'm can we significantly talk about it? more interested in mental health not saying that we're going to offer but i <laughs> and that that's what people think when they oh yeah pete does fitness blah 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 you know what that stuff's really easy it's just a tool 
it's just the thing that helps me recalibrate and rebalance but yeah. you know there's something so significant about that age bracket that you spoke about there and i always think about it like um you know when uh when dvds used to be about <laughs> and uh yeah yeah we, uh, i do remember them <laughs> yeah you know if you said like i used to have a colossal dvd collection because i used to i love stories you know i love storytelling and, and the art of learning things through the process of stories and i used to have masses amount of dvds you know like a whole wall it's something i developed for ages and then it was completely useless so i got rid of it <laughs> and um if you had like 500 dvds to pick from and you had a date round or something like that and you go hey which dvd do you want to watch you could end up spending two hours picking a dvd because there's so many options but if you've only got yeah. five dvds you pick one quite quickly yeah. yeah and i think when i when i lay that template onto where we are in life now it's a little bit like walking down a corridor and there used to be like 10 doors yeah there'd be 10 doors you could go through and at the end of the corridor there's the, the theoretical end is where you're 25 35 whatever but it's it's the theory is at that point in life you should have got your shit together people think yep. they're like you should have had at least a plan of something you're going to do you should have picked a dvd by now and it's not going to be forever so don't worry about it you're just going to pick it you're going to watch it for an hour and a half but now we have so many things we can do in life and that becomes the paralysis of analysis you know people have so many things they could do in life and then when they find themselves doing nothing because they keep procrastinating they keep walking down the corridor and they're like no i don't want to go work in a factory so they walk past that door I don't want to be in the police. I don't want to be a mechanic. I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to be an accountant. And that used to be it. They were like the 10 options or, you know, there, there was a certain amount of options, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Now there's another 700 doors. Do you want to create your own business? Do you want to be an entrepreneur? Do you want to do this? Do you want to be a whatever? Do you want to be a celebrity? Do you want to be a, and they keep, well, door, 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 door. And then they get halfway down the corridor and they go, I haven't picked anything yet. I'm 35. Yep. I can see the wall coming up at the end of this where everybody is just coming out of their doors and they're going into another door. They've done this for five years and now they're going to do something else and now they're going to do something else. I haven't done anything yet. And it's that self-imposed yeah. social pressure of failure to launch. I haven't picked a door. I feel like I should have done something by now and I feel like I should have achieved something by now. And we create a real anxiety around, I'm 35, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 22. What have I done? And we, we compound that now with social media when we go, hey, millionaire by 25. Hey, I've changed the world by 21. I've invented this. I've got a bajillion, gazillion followers who all think my life's amazing and I'm only 19. What have you done? Bang. Yeah. And that, that weight just drowns people. Yeah. And I mean, you look at, um, you're saying about social media and that is, that's another, that's another thing altogether. But I could, if I didn't know you, I, I could look up, I could have found your podcast on Instagram, seen how busy it is and been like, and, the, you know, the, the supporters you've got and things like that and been like, okay, this guy's made it. You know what I mean? Like, look how easy it is. Anyone can do that. But obviously, being in it and when you when you do If I didn't know you better, you, Pete, I'd think you were successful. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, but the no, thing is, what I mean is... If I didn't know secretly, you're an absolute sharish. No, I'm joking. But yeah, I know what you're saying. But if I, knowing you... I know how much graft you have to put in to do that. And I also know that if I want my podcast to get to another level of down of listeners and uh, success, I've now got to put more determination and uh, consistency into it. It doesn't just come, you can't just go and make a funny TikTok. No. And, it, you know, you will find someone who has a funny TikTok and it goes viral. But there's millions of them out there. Like, it's not just going to happen just because you think, I'll do that and I'll be minted then. I'll have loads of followers. And, and it's equally how you, it's how you define like that. that success because you could spend hours yeah. and hours and sincerely, you could have the best whatever. You'd have the best podcast. You could have the best yeah. business. You could have the best you know art gallery. But if it's in the middle of the woods and nobody knows about it, it's mm -hmm. going to be completely irrelevant as well. So there's that aspect of not procrastinating to the extent that you, you think there's something needs to be perfect. You think it's got to be this because yeah. from the outside looking in, everything looks a little bit better you know you're comparing their their highlight reel to your backstage yeah 100 i wanted to um you know the whole kind of a point ironically that we came on was that we wanted to get talking about this uh, opinions that we have you know one of the main things i wanted to ask your opinion about was that we looked at this report you know we had 87 percent on a little while ago and the report was entitled state of mental well-being on the front line and as soon as i read it 
I thought I've got to ask Matt about this because they'd surveyed yeah. over 10,000 emergency services workers. There were some crazy scary outcomes from that. And I know it's something we both sort of went away and took a few notes on. And the sort yeah. of negative impact and, and poor mental health for the frontline workers. What, what did you take away from it? Because I know we've had a couple of conversations leading up to it and we're like, dude, we're going to have to have a proper chat about this because <laughs> there's, uh, <clears throat> there's some stats in there. Yeah, so there was um, the, stat, the stats are one thing. I, I wasn't overly shocked seeing someone who's maybe a bit more aware of the state of play. You live in I don't this know about space, you. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't shocked. Um, you know, I've, I've interviewed a paramedic, a heart paramedic. I've interviewed a substance abuse recovery worker. So knowing now that we're in a pandemic, I'm not, I, know, I know what stress yeah. heart paramedics and paramedics have been under. Um, even though I wasn't shocked, I'm sure people would be shocked, but there was some really good bits from the study. I like the bit they done with the, um, I think you even spoke about it with Andy on the episode, the um, seven dimensions. Yes. Which breaks it down into seven pieces with a lot of subtitles underneath that. Um, I mean, I don't know if anybody could sustain all of them. No. Um, That's one's kind of like you hear about the entrepreneur's lifestyle and they go, I wake up in the morning, I have my (laughs) grass-fed chicken breast just before I do my 10 miles, which I'm doing on a ketogenic diet. And this is just before I meditate for an hour. And that's right before I start doing my diary and then I listen to something motivational. And you're like, well, how many people have got these 12 hours spare in the morning that I'm missing? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. It made made for an interesting read. There was a bit, what was it, um, you said, or Andy said about um, having that work-life balance and, maybe saying saying to people all right well after this time at night you can't send emails or something like that you know that's how we're gonna yeah it doesn't that's not gonna work it it actually it needs to be even above that doesn't it Mm -hmm. it needs to be a completely culture change Mm -hmm. so that actually we're looking after each other you can't just that's unrealistic and somebody at work send an email at night yeah it echoes back to that discipline in in uh and sort of freedom aspect that i was speaking about because you need to be able to discipline yourself to that whenever you say switch off time is and that time can change every single day it has to be a mindset shift that you develop yeah. the ability to put something down because there'll always be something essential everything's essential everything's really important everything is i need to hear about this immediately this mm. is a priority email i need you to get back to me we're a 24-hour service we're a 24-hour society now to somebody everything's urgent yeah uh, the one uh quote that did stand out to me was that if um, organisations spent one pound on wellbeing, they'd effectively get four pound return. Now, obviously, not every organisation chief or whatever has had this report land on their desk. No. I appreciate that. But I do think it, one thing you can take from this report is that we need to more to protect our employees and feel like that initially. But then, then to be, even if you have a foolproof, foolproof system in place. People are still going to have mental health. Everyone's got mental health, but mm. whether or not they start getting ill mental health, it might be from home life. Now, it's not the employer's responsibility to take care of the employee if they've got home life problems, but it makes for a good company if you can show that actually you do care about the people that are grafting for you day in, day out. Yeah. Um, and to me, I mean, I've had personal experience with it being in this steering group. I'm in a mental health steering group for both local authority and um, the airport where I'm working. And the opinions are still not, not great. And mm. it, I feel a bit out, especially the local authority, and I've got no issue saying this as it is, um, I feel like I'm like a thorn in those meetings because I'm boots on the ground. Mm. I'm not a politician. And sometimes I say things the way they should be said and not how they maybe want to be said in these meetings. And I, I've said that to a guys off record as well. Like I said, I know sometimes I don't come across the right way, but it infuriates me that everyone can see what we need to do mm. and what needs to be improved. And we need to have people, our crew managers, our, our watch managers, with a bit more training, you know? They, yeah, they've they, got to have a bit more training. But like you say, yeah. drawing that line between when does it become your responsibility? Because I always say to people, you've got to work twice as hard on yourself as you do on the job. It is personal yeah. development. How are you living? You know, are you standing on guard at, at the at the you know gates of your mind? What are you letting in there? What is affecting mm-hmm. you? You know, I think some people mentally skid into work mentally, 
um, in, a, in a ball of flames with something they've just been dealing with, with everything they've just thrown into their mind, with something that they've just observed or consumed from a social media perspective. And it, they, they come crashing into work, not ready with the level of emotional uh, awareness that is going to allow the best version of themselves to show up. Because I don't think... I don't think we're empowering ourselves. Yes, we have an obligation. And I think, you know, what the fact you double clicked on that, you know, four pound, one pound analogy and helping people quantify the outcome of supporting people with their mental health and with their own sort of mindset and how that will deliver a much more effective and well-rounded person at work. That's an important statistic and that will hopefully get a lot of people on board. But we have got to take a lot of personal accountability for the sort of stuff that we're allowing into our minds. What what I mean by... Um, I, t- I agree with that 100%. Um, you know, we're all, and I think when you get to this, the age I'm at in the last few years, I've been working on my resilience, my, you know, my mental health and making sure I'm on an even keel and making sure that I can cope with things like on the job. Uh, an example of something that's happened recently is we've got two new guys at A station. I won't go into too much detail. And they are not long out of school ish. So you're talking 19, 20. Um, their first job recently was a uh, car fire. 50 year old uh, woman and a 16 year old daughter, fully alike. They were first on scene, both from NBA. Mm. Um, not a great, obviously, as you can imagine, that's one of the more horrific things to see on the job. <laughs> um, Stinks as well. Both. And I'd heard about it through the grapevine that that's the job they'd been on. And my initial thing was. I'm going to give them a bell and see how they're doing. Obviously, we have the hot debrief. I know about the process a bit more now. Um, so they had a hot debrief with uh, our OIC. He said, obviously, we've got the EAP there if you want to use that. Blah, blah, blah. Left it at that as far as I'm aware. Don't quote me on it. Um, I phoned both of them, and they both text me, basically saying, can't get the images out of our heads, this, that, and the other. And they weren't that great the next morning either. So my thing is, like, why is occupational health not giving them a curtsy call? Because as we know, when people are suffering mental health, they won't pick up the phone. So why haven't they? So I've, I, I've, I messaged someone in occupational health and said, are these guys getting a call this morning, just a curtsy call, just to see how they're doing? No, not, not unless they're referred. Referred by who? Well, when the hot debrief's done, they, if they get referred, that's when I'm talking about training. So the watch manager that didn't refer them, they, they're fine now and it's not a, it was an issue. I just wanted to sort of nip it in the bug because I thought, you don't know what else these people have got going on. They're young lads. First time they've seen something as traumatic as that. Mm. And that's where he said, well, no, only if I refer them. And I thought, you look at their ages. It's one of their first jobs. They're straight out of school. You know, they've been watching, I don't know, Brooklyn 99 up until now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, They're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the way it works is, yes, they can be referred to occupational health. I don't know what uh, your system's like where you are. But trim only comes in after forty eight hours, so you're not you cannot refer them to trim until after forty eight hours. And my I, that sort of just stuck with me a little bit. I was like, that doesn't seem right. Like mm. if someone is suffering, um, and then they go to that job because we're all proud firefighters. We like to get in there and get stuck in at the job, yeah. regardless of what's going on in our personal life. And the discussion I had with patient health was, they said, well, shock, a bit of shock is normal and it's okay. Okay, that's fine. If you look up the symptoms of shock, that can be anger, irritation, fainting, tiredness. I know for a fact that one of them firefighters, two and a half hours later, drove across county in his car, go to work. And I'm like, so with all those symptoms you can get from shock, you're happy for him to drive to work because he's on call. He's an on-call firefighter, so he's gone off to work now. Well, didn't really get an answer from that. That's my thinking is we just need to, most watches are very good, aren't they? We all look after each other. I think it's, pretty pretty good on on a fire station most Um, are but i think that's if like you say if we don't take you know if we don't take these things that you're saying if we don't take the things that we're hearing a bit more seriously we're benefiting off the back end of people that came from an era with a lot of strong um watch culture and we're hemorrhaging those experiences and those um sort of approaches to life because these people back then came from a very different generation now we live in a bit more of a separated world we say we live in a more connected world we live in a more connected world from a technological perspective but some people have never felt so alone as they do now and 
I think we don't want to lull ourselves into a false sense of security by the belief that watch culture is strong, the watch is there to support them. Yes, that's that that should be the case. But don't take it for granted because we're a very different group of people now than we were back then. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I mean, you can talk about what needs to change until the sun goes down for, you know, for as long as you want. Gradually, like when I spoke to Chum the other day, the Mental Health for Children charity around this area, they said, you are starting to see more of it in schools now. Yeah. And ultimately, that is where it needs to start. It's stuff we teach in schools that is irrelevant for real life. Um, I mean, my, my daughter, we, we joke about it because she talks about um, God and all that sort of stuff. And she's like, oh, yeah, this, that, yeah. And I'll go, yeah, I don't really believe it. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, look, that's just what I believe. Yeah. I was like, Oh, because she asked to be christened. That's what it was. She came home because they learned it about it at school. Fair enough. Can I be christened? And I said, I said, you can when you're older. I said, when you're older, if you learn about more of it and you believe that's what you want to do, 100% do it. I said, but no, no I'm not saying we can go and get you christened. No, that's something you can do when you're older. Um, things like that. I don't, personally, I think we should learn about the history of our world and things like that. But we need to be teaching our kids what real life's like when you leave school. 100%, and mate. 100%. And building up their resilience so that when they leave the school and someone actually goes, well, you better be at work at 8 o'clock on Monday, you're not like, oh, sorry. I don't, you know, yeah, they're all yeah. just cowering. Yeah. You know, I've got a job to do now. That's just how life is. That's yeah. what I've got to do. Mm-hmm. Until that, we, I mean, we've got to go through years and years of generations now, you know, however long it takes for the cycle to go around. But, um, it Once is that cycle. That level, it's part of the I, saw, I saw a great box uh, box analogy of like a cycle of, and I, you hear it spoken about on, on a few other things. I think Joe Rogan's mentioned it a few times about we are heading into, and we're kind of living in really, I suppose it is hard now. Um, we're living in a time now of, of harder times, which is going to create harder, more resilient people. But those harder, more resilient people will create a safer time. But it won't be until that safer time where these people are going to feel supported and feel helped. We've got to go through that valley at the minute. And like you say, we've come now from a period, if you look at the other side of the cycle, where softer times created softer people. We went through yeah. a period where you didn't have to win. You didn't have to show up and, and deliver value at work. You just had to show up. Do you know what I mean? You, you just got a mm. participation medal. You didn't have to deliver value. And we are sleepwalking people sleepwalking our children off a cliff where they think it's okay just to show up they think it's okay just to be part of the team and that sort of stuff that's not how real life works someone is going to shake their finger in your face and tell you you're shit if you don't Mm -hmm. deliver value you need to know that that is coming around the corner and we need to give people that resiliency to be able to deal with it otherwise we're lulling them into a sort of false sense of security you know, and we're gonna, oh. we're gonna, and that's where we're gonna get people in their mid to late twenties, thirties, feel the ground fall away from them, because we've we've built a false platform yeah. for them to stand on, yeah. and that's not how life works. Um, it's no. a sad thing to have. To, I always say to people, don't let your education get in the way of your own personal development. You know, don't allow what you've done in school to stop you to continuing to grow. That you know, that was designed to deliver you into a system where you worked in a factory or you worked in something like that. That's not the world that we live in all the time now. You need to be, that's just the base level. And some of that you don't need to take with you. Some of it's not going to serve you. You need to go on and to continue to develop yourself far beyond that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I tried a prime example. My my oldest is um, she's nine now. And she's going through that phase where she likes something new every week. You know? Yeah. But one thing she absolutely loves is skateboarding. She's just gone mad for it. And, uh, We've got a skateboard and we've got, some, you know, knee pads and things like that. We said, we'll go take to the skate park. And then before she's even trying to go in a straight line, she's trying to do all these tricks. And I went, what are you doing? I'm trying to do this. And I went, you can't even rock. You can't even roll. I don't know what terminology is. You can't even <laughs> roll in a straight line yet. I know, but I saw someone doing this on, on this kid's YouTube or whatever. I think it was Skylar Brown who got uh, the, the Olympic, young Olympian at one bronze. And uh, I said, you've got to learn the basics. And obviously, it's boring the basics, you know. You've got to learn yeah. the foundation. Um, I went, I know it sucks, right? I said, it, but you've got to do that first. Once you've got control of that board, then everything else will fall into place. I said, but it doesn't come without practice. And then 
she wouldn't ask to go for a week. She's had to switch and other stuff to go on. Yeah. And I'm like, and she's, oh, I could do this last week. And I went, yeah, but you're watching that Skylar on YouTube. I said, she's been practicing every day. Mm-hmm. Our, our kids can do whatever they want, can't they? But if they really want to go for something, oh, mate. Them, it's the best time. time. That's how yeah. valuable time is. The time that they have. Yeah. And the the opportunities and the accelerated way that things are developing in the world now. It's never been the best time yeah. ever. They're, they're faced with some colossal challenges, no doubt, but they've never had so many resources. So, yeah, it's just about what you got for that. Going back to that, like, it's not not given that you're going to be successful. Believe me, people still have to work for it. Yeah, You've absolutely. got better, like you say, you've got the most opportunities we've ever had with the stuff and technology we've got now, but you've got to put that time in. Mm. And so, don't allow the, that black word, potential to uh yeah to make you think that you haven't got to work for it you know you otherwise you will end up that 33 35 year old who potential means nothing it's a bit like ideas nobody pays you for your ideas they pay you for your output you know you yeah. can't you get no one's paying you for your potential you know what i mean we've got to be so right. careful with that word i keep getting told how much potential the podcast has and blah 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 yeah but then you need to go through two years of people not answering your phone calls not answering your emails not showing up for calls Saying and then yeah. just people just going, who are you? No, I ain't got time for it. You've got to keep pushing that boulder uphill just to come back the next day and realize it's rolled back down to the bottom <laughs> and start again yeah. and start again and start again. That is, that's how you develop a blade. You've got to keep beating on that tool. You've yeah. got to keep smashing it. You've got to keep pushing it back into the the iron and forging it and then hammering yeah. it and hammering it and hammering it. You've got to build a big appetite for eating shit. You know, you've just got to keep yeah. swallowing it and swallowing it and swallowing it, and then eventually, um, you you'll start creating something out of the side of it. That's the goal, Matt. I always love our chats, mate. I always love catching up with you. Yeah, okay. You're walking that yeah. that thin red line, and I love Good, I mate. love what you do, yeah. mate. You, uh, it takes a lot of bravery to go in and have the conversations that you are having with people, and I think it's really powerful. That's why I like supporting the stuff that you do, and that's why I like having you on because I really think you. You're very much in the trenches of it, and uh, it's got to be difficult every time to, like we said earlier, go down into the cellar with people and you know hear them talk about the stuff that they've gone through, and then have the bravery to come out and and share it with the world whilst trying to strike your own balance, mate. So I think it's really powerful yeah, no, to do, and I, I really feel privileged that you come mate. on and share it. No, I'd say um, up to any support I get, um, specifically from you and um, Dean, the guy, you know, probably two or three main people that will back me up. And uh, I'd say, and I've met through his podcast. It's been it's been brilliant. And um, we've got there's my shirt there. Cheers, your badge. You hey, I love it. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that having that shirt made and then putting a couple of supporters on it. You know, knowing that I had them backing me. You know, it means a lot. And um, it shows that there is people out there that want to listen and people that want to push for the stigma to end around this mental health. So I'll. I just need to be more consistent next year um, because I know from looking at the numbers that actually when I launch an episode, a lump of people do tune in. They do. Um, I'm one of them. So I've just got to, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, but it just means that I know, and this is one of my points that when I started the podcast is I want one out every week, you know, because people are going to be expecting that to pop up saying this is available now, you know. Um, and there is the people out there to talk to. So I just got to get my shit together. Get on with it, <laughs> <laughs> mate. The next thing we have to do is, uh, and you know, like well, we sort of re- referred to here, we have not done anything in person. The next challenge that you do, let's make it something we can do together, and let, let's put let's push that public accountability. I'm going to put this on there. I'm not going to yeah, edit mate. this bit out, uh, and we will do something together. I want to do more oh. stuff supporting mental health. We, we the charity is one of our um, media partners. We've had a bunch of people on from there, and the work that you do is invaluable to that whole overarching aspect of it. That's why I love to keep plugging into it. You kind of rebalance me and refocus me. I kind of feel like whatever I have a conversation okay. with you, you recalibrate my moral compass. So I want us, I want us to do <laughs> some more stuff together. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so keep going, mate. I'm listening. People are yeah. listening. And what you're doing is really powerful. Yeah. Send my love to the good lady right. as well. All right. Will do, mate. Will See do. you soon. Take care, mate. 
Firefighters Podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operators. Through a series of wide-ranging conversations celebrating those within our sector, we seek to encourage and support this incredible group of people. It's brought to you by myself, Operational Firefighter, Pete Wakefield, and I speak with individuals from all walks of life who I sincerely believe can add value to or develop those who have chosen this life path. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world, and thank you for listening.